Hello, welcome back to Refractions. I am Stephen Mellon, your host, and I am so psyched that we have the amazingly talented uh, David Burnett joining us. David, hello. Hello. Okay, I guess I can actually talk. That's exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I don't know about your career is, uh, did you, was there like a breakout assignment was there something that really launched you onto the national stage um well there were a couple of of stories i had uh managed to i started working in high school with a little weekly paper in salt lake city uh that was where i first kind of put together that in one day you could shoot film soup it print it make a screen print for the lithographers, send it to the editor, and in a day or two, the, it would be out in the paper. And that was what really got me going, was seeing something beyond just putting the negatives or a print in a drawer and letting them sit there. So I worked uh, junior and senior year for this, this uh, little weekly paper, the Rocky Mountain Review. And then in college, between my um, junior and senior year of college, having you know taken pictures of the hockey players and sold them eight by 10 color prints from some lab at the back of uh, Popular Photography Magazine for $3, you could get an eight by 10 color print and then I'd sell it for five. And uh, that was like real money when you made that two bucks. But I had uh, managed to sort of talk to the right people. I mean, honestly, I, I don't know how it happened. Spring break, I went back to New York, uh, went to Look Magazine. They didn't have anything. Went to Newsweek, they didn't have anything. And there was a woman named, a wonderful woman named Ruth Lester who worked at Life Magazine. And her job in 1967 was to look at people bringing pictures in off the sidewalk. They didn't you know, nowadays they'll do anything they can not to have to engage anybody that isn't already on their Rolodex. They just don't want to do that. And so um, at the time, I, I don't know, I look back, I think it probably was not a very impressive group of pictures I had, but she was very nice and she was trying to help me. And she said, well, we don't have anything at life, but let me call downstairs and see if maybe Bo Hartshorn, who was the black and white editor at Time Magazine. And I, he said, yeah, okay. She hangs up and sends me down to see him. And then two weeks later, I get a letter from them saying, we'd like you to work as a, uh, they didn't use the word intern, but that's what it would be now. It was three days a week. I got 85 bucks a week, which in those days was basically enough to live on. And it got me into Time Magazine, and I spent the summer in New York and in Washington, D.C., and I had 11 pictures published, which was, you know, for a 20-year-old kid, it was a pretty big deal. The downside being that I was too young to go, I'm going to tell my mail here, I'm sorry, I forgot to disrupt everything. Um, and... Um, and then I went back to college, and I finished, and the next year, they gave me a contract to basically work um, one day a week, which in those days, the day rate was 125 a day and 75 for a half day and uh, working in Washington, D.C. And I was there for about six months and then was taking too many freelance jobs. So they decided to send me to Miami, which I did for a year and a half. And after a year in Miami, it just wasn't, things were not, very exciting. There weren't that many things to, to cover. And a friend of mine, John Olson, who had been the youngest Life Magazine staff photographer ever hired, I think he was 21 or 22, had gone back to Vietnam where he started. He'd been in the army as a photographer and then went back to do a story for life. And he said, boy, there's still a lot of freelance work in Vietnam. So I just, I bought a San Francisco Saigon ticket and uh, ended up thinking I would maybe go for a couple of months, and I ended up staying for two years. And at that point, uh, in the second year, I kind of got on with Life Magazine, 
And when I came back in the fall of 1972, I was a contract guy with Life Magazine. I was going off to do my first cover story on Don Shula and the undefeated Miami Dolphins. And the night the, the, the morning I was supposed to leave was the morning that the, the senior staff people announced that Life Magazine was closing effective now. So all of that just kind of went away, just when I was kind of starting to really have a career with life. And I didn't know what to do. I had signed a, a contract for the next year, so I had a little bit of money to live on. But in, in uh, May of 73, I, was, um, I got a phone call from Raymond Depardon, the French photographer, and who was one of the founders of Gamma, the great... French agency. And he said, and I didn't realize what had happened, that a bunch of the Gamma people were unhappy and they left and formed Sigma. And so now you have these two very competitive French agencies. I went to work for Gamma and that was where I really had a chance to photograph around the world, probably way better than it ever would have been with Life magazine. And the story that I did in Chile in September of 1973, which was the coup d'etat that overthrew the uh, elected president, Salvador Allende. It was a big, big story in Europe. Not some, I mean, at the time, Nixon and Kissinger were kind of uh, playing ball with all the generals who had taken over and, and killed Allende. Um, so it wasn't as big a story in the States. But in Europe, it was a very big deal. And that really, I think, more than any other single piece of work probably got me launched a little bit in that in that world. When you, when you talk about working with those agencies that you're like, you started working for them, are they then commissioning the stories and sending you out? Like, what was the relationship well, then? There was, the, the great thing about it is that they had started Gamma, they being the original five photographers, and a sales guy and a darkroom guy in this little boutique-y kind of office. And it grew quite rapidly. But their whole idea was to work on spec. It was like, yeah, we'll take an assignment if it comes along. But there were so many magazines. There were so many markets um, that if you had a good set of pictures, they could sell them. And if it was a somewhat exclusive or hard to get material, they could sell it for a lot of money. And it just seemed like a great deal. It's like the agency would split expenses 50-50 with you. And then whatever came in on the sales, you'd split that 50-50. And I never really got rich. There were people who would get a real scoop. And there was a wonderful guy who left, one of the original founders of Gamma, and who left And when they did the split. He went off to Sigma, a guy named Henri Bureau. And he just was the master of the uh, uh, of the scoop, and he would usually they he would you know coup d'état in Lisbon. He'd get a Learjet and they'd share the price of the price of the plane with French TV. They'd go down. And he'd have the plane wait and come back. Go shoot for three hours. Come back. Fly back to Paris. Boom. Ten pages in Perry Match and a cover. That kind of thing. I didn't get so much of that, but I, I definitely was, was loving this idea of, well, we'll decide it, or maybe, okay, we can, we're, we're happy to have an assignment, but the main thing is get out, get the work done, and there is enough of a world that wants these pictures and these picture stories that it was enough to make it happen. And for me, the saddest thing about the whole arc of my career is that, uh, all those magazines that used to be flush and had a lot of pages and had money because they were, you know, you had the double page ad from Buick, all of this stuff that is just kind of dissolved and gone up in smoke now. There's just so few places to get it, get it published. I don't know any of the people involved, but I worked for Time Magazine for 40 years and I have no idea who anybody is that works there now. They frankly, I'm pretty sure they don't really want to hear from an old guy. They want to, everybody wants to work with the people they know and the people that are their uh, colleagues 
sort of generationally, I think. And, uh, you know, it's hard to talk about this without becoming uh, Mr. Wilson telling Dennis the Menace to get off the front lawn. <laughs> but, but there, it, it's, it is interesting that there is, um, like, you can't even, and, the, you know, that's my really, my greatest complain about what's happened to our business that was so full of smart people, uh, interesting people, and courteous people. There was always courtesy. If you sent, if you had an idea for somebody and you sent them a note or you'd leave them a phone message, they'd always get back to you. Nine times out of the 10, it would be, yeah, we can't use it, but thanks for thinking of me because thinking that the next time you had an idea, you would at least call them in case it was one they did want. And that kind of, that sense of, of courtesy, the simplest level of engagement and courtesy has just been completely washed away in this business. Nobody wants to hear from you. Uh, they don't really, you know, unless you can do something that they need filled right now, it's very hard to, to even get in touch with photo editors. I think to me, that's the saddest thing because there's so much of the great interaction that used to happen after, after Vietnam fell in 1970. I'm just, I'm one little more story. Go for uh, it. Suzanne Ritchie, who was this wonderful woman who was, uh, uh, she was editing the world section of Time Magazine. And I had been meaning to go back to Saigon in 1975, in the spring of 75, when it looked as if the North Vietnamese were finally going to end the war. And I had been given another assignment. I ended up not going to Vietnam. Vietnam falls in the end of April. And in the um, in a few weeks later, I went to Suzanne and I just said, walked in and said, so listen, Suzanne, do you think there really is a uh, domino theory that that lives that works is there does the domino theory really work and it was kind of like a dumb question it was like because the answer was well if so the next domino is going to be south korea so a little light bulb goes on give me 200 rolls of kodachrome and i'll go do a great story on korea I'll tell you what it's like because nobody knows and i went off to korea and end up spending we got a, a and this thing started to take on a weight of its own and two of the big foreign correspondents came in and we had a interview with the Korean president. And fortunately it was outside in the garden so you could shoot with a motor and he wouldn't even hear it. But it was the kind of thing where you could say, I think, you, you know, this is going to be a good story. And it ended up being a cover and like four or five pages of color. And it was, it was a real team thing between photographer and editor it wasn't just the editor telling the photographer and i think so much of what's happening now is kind of that world and i feel bad when i i you know i occasionally will get a, a note or a letter from somebody just saying oh man i really want to do what you're doing it's like well i'm not really doing it right now and i don't know where anybody does it there are a few pretty successful magazine photographers out there right now but a handful compared to what used to be that world. And I just, I kind of mourn for what was a great working arrangement for so long and which has just kind of dissolved. The internet has devalued pictures so much in so many ways. Um, magazines have been struggling, you know, the old advertising model for magazines has kind of gone away. So. It's tough, and I, I feel bad for young photographers because if you don't have enough money to kind of make a go of it, it's very, very hard to do that. But good talent still kind of rises up, and, um, you know, it's it's a great... it's. I mean, I still love looking at social media, not because it's social media. I love seeing pictures I haven't seen before. And that, to me, is really the uh, the juicy thing. Of what, you know, right now, you take your phone, there is no way that you should miss anything now. Every, <laughs> every good story that gets out there. I mean, the, um, the one thing that I, I, I kind of got a little bit irked about was 
how a lot of young photojournalists have no idea who any of the people are who came before them. And my my theory, I don't know if it, there's any truth to it or not, but my theory is that because you can take a picture and immediately look at it, there is, uh, on the back of your camera, there is this kind of, uh, oh, I got to pat myself on the back because I'm such a great artist because look what I've just created five seconds ago. And that it's it's way too much of people getting... Uh, perhaps uh, overly like immediate... self-congratulatory about what it is they're doing and not really understanding that, well, yeah, okay, you can call yourself a photojournalist, but if you don't know who David Douglas Duncan and James Stanfield and Larry Burroughs, if you don't know who those people are, who who all did it with manual Nikon and, and Canon and Leica cameras, and they had to put film in after shooting 36 pictures and you know the hard way let's just call it the hard way if you don't know who they are and what they've done how do you have a, any way of trying to figure out what it is that you do in the greater world of what photography is about and um i just feel bad that that there is such a, a lack of uh, especially in an age where it takes no effort to to see the work. I mean, I had, I met this very talented young woman with a newspaper in Pennsylvania and it, and uh, I was with two or three of the people from her newspaper and we're sitting around having a beer. And I, I mentioned somebody, I don't know if it was David Duncan or whoever it was. And she was like, oh, who's that? I said, have you never heard of David Douglas Duncan? And, and then I named like three or four other people and they were all, uh, negative response. I said, okay, here's the deal. For the next, let's say 10 weeks, every week, I'm going to just text you a name and you have to take half an hour, an hour, go online. And it's the easiest thing in the world to do now. And look at that work. And I mean, I kind of feel like my generation needs to be a little bit more uh, demanding of the the idea of educating younger photographers as to what was great photography and why it's important to see it. I mean, why you can learn so much. You know, everybody knows who Robert Frank is. Most people know who Larry Burroughs is, but there were a lot of other photographers. I mean, a lot of photographers doing great work for a very long time. And I think somehow it would be nice to put something together where, you know, maybe we could do it here and just, have a, a way of presenting great photography and then forcing anyone who thinks they're a photojournalist to look at it, <laughs> spend time. <laughs> it. You will look at it. <laughs> you're, you might be good. And just because you can see your picture on the back of your camera doesn't mean you're great yet. So no. learn the people who really knew how to, they spent the time and they did it the hard way. There's something very good to learn about that, I think. Absolutely. No, it's an interesting idea. It's true. Just to, you know, have a curated uh, collection of the, you know, photo history, but in a, in a kind of driven sense of it. Because I haven't, I mean, I haven't, you know, I went to photo school, I, like I studied it and everything, but it's, you know, it's been 30 years. It's been a long time since I like really sat down and studied, you know, some of the history of it. It's something to think about for sure. You no, know, and I, I find it's really uh, like an uplifting and wonderful and exciting thing. I had never heard of the Turkish photographer Ara Guler until I was going to Turkey and somebody said, oh, you got to call this guy. Well, I ended up on the trip I was on. It didn't work out. But the discovery that you can make about what other people have done to me is one of the probably the single greatest joy of, of what all of this digital and technological communication is about. It is a gift to be able to expand your own vision. And I think, you know, I, I just recently was awarded the, um, I was very moved by it, by the, um, the Photo Mentor Award by the Palm Beach Photo uh, Center. And I said, geez, I, 
I'm not really, you know, I don't go around and like put my arm around a lot of photographers and say, well, maybe you ought to be using a 28 instead of a 24 or something. I mean, I, I don't feel in that way that I know people are mentoring in that, in that way, but it's just not something I've ever done. But having in my own life studied Larry Burroughs work and, um, the photographers at Look Magazine and George Silk at Life Magazine. As I was growing up, I I looked at those magazines every week or every two weeks in the case of Look Magazine. And you would just look at the stuff and, and try and figure out how did they do this? How did they talk their way in? What kind of gear do they have? Or how do you think? And I mean, in most cases, I never even got to meet any of those, those folks. But in some odd way, I feel like they were mentoring me, even though I never had coffee with them even once, which I think back, I would have loved to, I wish I'd been a little pushier about introducing myself to people because um, there was, you know, most of, most of the people whose work you admire appreciate, not that you have to be fawning about it, but just the appreciation of what the work has been. And I get, occasionally I'll get now, I get a note from somebody saying, oh my God, I've been traveling. Ever since I got into photography, I've been looking at your work. So maybe there are here or there uh, the occasional person who, without my knowing it, feels like they're being mentored by what they see about what I do. So it kind of, it flows to you and then it flows out of you, I think. Because I mean, you like, even though you're not having any direct contact with some of the younger photographers you've got like tens of thousands of followers on instagram so there's people out there that are seeing the work and the history and everything so i mean it's you know you've had an impact on me like indirectly i don't know exactly i couldn't i don't know if i'd be able to like phrase it but just like our you know we've known each other for a long time and we met i don't know got 15 years ago through uh our old agent and you know it's just it's been great knowing knowing you in that time where I was, you know, I was there in Florida. This is when we started talking about the conversation. And just when you, when you started really sharing all of the stories and the relationship you had with uh, the agency that you created, I mean, there was just, there's such a, a generosity and knowledge base. And so maybe you are having that impact just, you know, like one little conversation at a time you're not necessarily keeping track of it but it just like it it hit me and there was other people in the room that you know wasn't just me that was listening to the talk so um i think it is it is going maybe it's just less you know less cumulative than you realize well i don't know i mean it's there's no way you can really quantify it but i know that i was i would i would look at stories and the first thing you you'd see in print at least you'd you'd see something it's like wow that's good that the first thing is you get that little bit of a wow hit it's like well wow, okay or it's like yeah i wouldn't have made that picture that's way too, that's way too good or i i'm i don't think i would have been perceptive enough and you start to throw yourself into it and i think those are the kind of um you know the the self questioning and like how would i have done this so god look at how cool they had to have been to stay cool and uh, you know, we, we um, I was, I didn't know her really well, but I knew Catherine Leroy, a young French photographer when she was 20 something. I think she went to Vietnam with her one Leica and she ended up making these amazing pictures. And when you see and, you know, sadly, she passed away like 15, 18 years ago, but I did get to know her later in Iran and then in, in New York and Washington a little bit. And she is, um, she was somebody who was just like, uh, you knew that it was the kernel of her own energy that drove her to be able to make these things happen, especially for a woman photographer in Vietnam where it was not a very welcoming situation. She overcame a lot of BS that, that, the male photographers probably didn't have to go through, but I, I don't know. I, I, I've seen a few books, one about her and one book that she helped put together. I think it's called under fire 
photographer's work from Vietnam. And when you look at these compilations of all these different photographers, there's something very, um, to me, is very moving and very interesting that you start, and, and in so many cases, you don't even know who the photographers are. You know them by their work. And I think probably, you know, people know you. I mean, they might think they, they know you or they know me, but they really know us by our work the same way that I, there are all these people that I haven't met yet, but I'm very aware of, of their photographs and the power of their photographs. And Absolutely. the one thing I love to do and that we could never really do with the facility that we have now is to just send little uh, at a boy and at a girl notes to people. When I'll see a picture, it's like it'll end up on Instagram, like you say, or in Facebook or something. It's like, damn, that's that's a good picture. And it's I get a great kick out of just writing a little three line thing uh you know i don't go on and on about it but it's just there's a real joy in in seeing great photography and i still get a kick out of that as i'm sure you do that what do you mean that you can't do it anymore i feel like that that's where the the part is right under the light is where you can just put the little you know well i mean it's it's uh like this this young polish photographer whose picture i saw last night of uh a it's like this little kernel of american football is taking off and all over europe and he was on a field and it was the fog was moving in and it was nighttime and the lights are up i thought man this guy really nailed it and and i sent him a little note and he sent me a thank you note back i said but people need to you know for those of us who have been around a while i think it's part of what we are obliged to do is to just tell somebody when they've done a good job because you don't have like there's no more letters of the editor. There's likes, likes. Uh, you know, you can put a million likes in an empty dog food can, and that's kind of where they'll spend their life. Um, I'm I'm not that interested in likes even remotely. I am very interested in comments because I I do end up and my stuff mainly ends up that I just kind of throw out there on Facebook because. The one thing of all the things I don't like about Facebook, the one thing I really do like is that you can write long. And when I, I've just kind of discovered this thing the last few years, I love writing. I wrote a, a novel, I wrote a novel during COVID and it needs work and it isn't ready to be published yet. But I wrote 85,000 words, which is probably more than I wrote in college in four years. And and I'm just, I'm, I love writing how I feel, especially I look back at a picture from 10 or 20 or 30 years ago and looking at your work with a distance, you see it very differently than you would see it if you shot it last week. There's something very current about the current stuff. And when you look at pictures and then you really start to think, well, what was I thinking? Or why did I, why didn't I move in? Or why didn't I go wide or why didn't i oh my god it's right there it's so obvious to it's obvious to everybody but the me who was there holding the camera at the time but i think these things are really good for all photographers to to look at you know you never should get tired of looking at your own work whether it was last week or 20 years ago because the what i uh when i do speak i i kind of finish now on uh, this thing that I've become very uh, moved by, which is the understanding that, especially for those of us who worked doing assignments for magazines and newspapers all these years, that that's all great. It's great to have that career. But the most important pictures that you'll ever take are of the things in your own life, your friends, your family, your dog. Tyrone, did you hear that? <laughs> um, it's those little things that start to be part of the very intimate part of your own life and that no one else probably could or would take. Uh, to me, those start to become things that are really important and maybe the most important. Has and, that changed or is that something, is that something 
I don't know. I mean, I just don't think I ever really thought about it so much as I have now. You know, I get to be an older guy, you start to think about things differently. But I, basically, um, I mean, I still kind of kick myself in the butt for having when my folks, we lived in our house in Salt Lake City from 1946 until my folks sold it in about 1990. And I did not, I, this is a, a a gigantic mistake that I made. I did not go home and rescue all this big 1951 Campbell soup box that had all the little envelopes with the negatives that the pictures had come back from the drugstore. And then they, my, you know, my mom would take the prints and put them in a little uh, scrapbook, and that's great. And we don't need the negatives. We've got the the prints. It's like, oh yeah. my god! And I did not go home and rescue those negatives. So, what I would say to anybody who, anyone is moving in your family or is selling the house, rescue the negatives because the negatives are really the the gold up in them their hills where all those great pictures are living and probably. Uh, you know, you, you could say, well, you know, they were just snapshot photographers, but that is part of the life that you've lived. And that I just every day I feel like a jerk for having not been smart enough to see that that was the one thing I should have gone back and tried to rescue. It's interesting you talk about the envelope and the you know, the the cut, you know, when the 35 millimeter was getting cut down to the four or five frames, so it, it would right. fit into that envelope. Right. I remember the pulling those out and everything and then trying to re-sleeve them into the professional, you know, notebooks afterwards was such a nightmare. And so, uh, and, and I talked was, to my student when you became aware of the word glassine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do talk to my students a little bit about this and we try to do it in class and everything. It's like, uh, we print, you know, it's like we do plenty of work and everything that's just on the screen and everything, but I am trying to get, you know, a few of the assignments actually printed. So they, they've got the, you know, the hard copy in hand so they can start understanding like the, you know, just the feel about the presentation and how it changes and how it feels to have something up on the wall that you have to live with for a while. And, you know, see if it... Oh, I mean, you can see I've got a, a bunch here and this this apartment is full. Every wall has got like, oh, you don't have any of those paintings of little children with the big eyes? No, I have my own photo, <laughs> my own photograph. And, um, you know, it, it sometimes it gets to be a bit much, but uh, there is something magical about printing that is way better than a screen. A screen is, it's like the tool to let your imagination run off with something, but holding a print in your hand, you know, I have a friend with a, runs a lab up in Massachusetts on Cape Cod. He said, look, it's not a photograph until you print it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that there's something to that, that you should always, um, you know, there, it, and it takes on a very different, um, your impression, I think, is very different when you can hold it in your hand, you're looking on the wall or whatever it is. And all those years when we started, so I worked for Gamma for two years back in, in early 70s. And then with uh, Robert Pledge uh, started Contact Press Images. And it was still in 1975, 76, it was still the world where it was kind of 90% black and white. It wasn't until the late 70s, maybe even the, actually the 80s, that like Time Magazine, who was my main squeeze, could run color from the same week. They had to like get the plates done this week and then it'll be out in next week's magazine. But you couldn't do it. Uh, you couldn't like the film arrives on Thursday and you soup it and you look it out and lay it out on Friday and the magazine goes to bed over the weekend and Monday you have it. No, you needed an extra week for those early years that I was shooting color. And then all of a sudden they could do color, same, sort of same day color and that changed everything. But in those early years, everything was, you know, it was 90, 10 black and white to color because that's what the clients could use, and that's where you were going to be able to make a sale. So 
black and white. You all, whatever else you had, I had uh, uh, Nikon's for a long time, and up up until 1978, I changed over to Canon. But I always had a Leica with a 35 and Tri-X here. Whatever else I was carrying, how many or how few camera bags, however many uh, extra extra cameras, and usually I had four cameras. It was like 28, 35, 105, 180, or some <laughs> variation of that. And your four by five. And well, that came later, really. But I mean, I, I, uh, I bought the four by five in the early '90s from a friend at the Salt Lake Tribune, and my first speed graphic it still has Salt Lake Tribune painted on the top. But nice. you know, the 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 newspapers they're probably pretty much done by now. But they were like, yeah, we got to empty out this cabinet here. We could we can put in a workstation. Oh, that's great. So they would take all the old camera gear and. You know, I paid 200 bucks and I probably paid too much for it, but it was 200 bucks for a working speed graphic that still has Salt Lake Tribune painted on the top. Very and, nice. And, you know, I've been adding things to them, many cameras, some would say too many uh, ever since. But yeah, I mean, and, you know, what's so great about photography is like, are you getting bored? You know, it's like, it sounds like a, an ad for Geritol or something. Are you getting bored with photography? Well, buy yourself a camera that you've never used before and like force yourself. You know, people say with a four by five speed graphics, like, well, doesn't that really slow you down? So that's the point. <laughs> that's, Great. The whole, that's the whole idea. I just kind of like, Whoa, okay, we're going to just take it down a couple of notches. And now we're going to make one picture, maybe two, if we can flip the holder and get that second sheet of film in there quickly. But it's, um, or get a 120, get an old Roly or a Mamiya twin lens reflex and uh, and go shoot a couple of rolls of 120 film. And it will be frustrating and liberating and eye-opening. And did I mention frustrating? Because I mean, <laughs> The whole thing about shooting film is that you have to do it. Like it isn't like all these beautiful modern digital cameras that do everything for you. You still have to do it. And uh, there isn't anybody around who wouldn't be better off being at least one day a week forced to shoot something. They aren't particularly excited to shoot with a camera that they're barely able to understand how to make it work. <laughs> It makes you dig deeper into the things that really are important, I think. And that that is that never gets old. That is just that is still fun. It's I mean, I'm doing this for 60 years and it's still fun. I can't even believe that. But yeah, I mean, it was like technically it was last year was the 60th anniversary. I forgot to have a cake. You forgot? <laughs> the, cake, the cake is the cake is getting a camera and going out and shooting. We, where I am down here in Florida, there is, um, I'm near a golf course. Hey, it's Florida. They have golf courses like every 20 feet. <laughs> so on the, um, on one side, there are a lot of birds and the birds come in and they're there every night. That's kind of cool. But on the other side, this is family of little Egyptian geese, which look kind of like a very, it's looked like took like they took a duck over to Earl Scheib and gave it a paint job. It's beautiful, sort of brown and gray and white. And like a month and a half ago, maybe they had babies. And in the beginning, there were six little little bitty little bitty goslings. And then one day there were four of them. And then like a week later, there was one guy left. And, you know, it's it's the golf course, but it's also nature. There's gators, there's owls that swoop in and grab God knows what. And there's one little guy. So during the big, they had a big uh, golf tournament here, the Cognizant Classic, right, right, passes right next door here. And there was a lot of airtime showing these beautiful birds just sort of standing around. And the baby... Now he's kind of getting up. He's now he's about like nine years old, a nine year old kid or a 10 year old kid knows where to eat. He's learned how to swim, can't fly yet. And one of the security, <laughs> one of the security guys 
who is like making sure that people don't like run all over the green at night or stuff. We're look we're looking at the mom and the dad and the baby walking around. So hey, does he have a name yet? Said, so, oh well, yeah, that's why don't we call him Paco? Okay, so now he's been Paco now for the last two and a half weeks since the golf tournament. And every morning when I walk my dog, I look for this bird and we kind of build up this little community of Paco watchers around the country. <laughs> and, you know, I tell you this, I love this camera. This is a RX-10 Mark IV, 24 to 600. You can do everything with cameras like this. these all-in-one cameras. They're a little clunky maybe, but they let you imitate yourself when you had to carry four cameras in a donkey bag on an assignment. And I'm just, every day I take this out, I'm looking for Paco. I'm looking for Paco with his mom and dad. And it's like, well, who cares about a little bird? Yeah, well, I'm not a great wildlife photographer, but once you find something that interests you, that's what the whole joy of photography gets to be about. Like, um, I don't know. I mean, um, I, um, I mean, you've been really good. I mean, I get, I mean, you should, you had like the assignment creator where they, people were throwing ideas at you, you know, storylines and everything. And then were you also pitching the, the stories? Like where, were there things that were coming up there that you wanted to? And it, like, I mean, I guess that gets back to that relationship you were referencing about the, the days of having the photo editor where you're like, you know, going in with like, Hey, I want to get out and shoot the, you know, um i i always had pretty good uh um relationships with editors and there were there was you know sometimes you're dealing with big structure like national geographic uh there were a couple of editors there that i i loved working with and i did a few stories with but the structure of geographic is such there's so much uh pitching of ideas and so relatively few spaces in the magazine to be able to deal with all that stuff that, it, I mean, I've done, I don't know, three or four stories for the geographic. To me, that sounds like a lot, given that every story was, well, the first one was 15 weeks spread out over three years. And then the others have been a little bit more like a, a month doing Hurricane uh, Katrina and a month spread out doing a story on Orlando and a few other things. I mean, it's just, it's it's great when it happens, but there there's it's so competitive for that space. Uh, with Time Magazine, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, the, one of the issues for people who did the kind of work I was doing is that, now you have both AP who've got really good photographers and you have Reuters who've got really good photographers and you've got Getty Images who've got hundreds of people all over the world and a lot of those people are really good. So there is just this kind of saturation that didn't, I would say didn't exist. When we started Contact in 1975, the first story I did was we, um, we heard that That me? Oh, David just froze. Shoot. We just lost David. Hopefully he'll be able to unlock in a moment. Um, some wonderful stories. I love hearing him talking about chasing a bird on the golf course. Um, give me one second. Just going to. See if we can find our guest. Hopefully he's coming back soon. Oop. Give us one moment as we resolve this. Apologies. Dun, 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 dun. Gotta love technology. In my dream world, we'd all be doing this in person, be flying the studio down, set the soundstage up somewhere. 
or fly in the guest maybe we can do this like every week like the live talk show just have to find a uh just need to get bnh to go bnh news network well speaking out loud here but hopefully he'll be back up shortly nope. Hold on. What did you just say? Zoom died. Just one second. Apologies. Oh. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. It's all right. We have your voice back at least. We're going to lose some of the... Uh... He's back. He's okay. back. <laughs> all right. So we were we were talking about uh, the ideas and, you know, a little bit about the creativity aspect oh, of it. Video. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. I really do know how to do this stuff, but I don't know. <laughs> Somebody rolled a... Uh, cyber grenade in there. So, okay, I, so I I was aware of the fact that because the Today Show, when they talked about Arizona, had not mentioned cowboys, and there were a bunch of pissed off cowboys who said, and I quote Ed Overmeyer, well, we decided we're going to have ourselves a cattle drive and let them know that the cowboys are still out there. So I spent a month on a cattle drive and it was fantastic. It was a lot of Kodachrome, a lot of Tri-X, a lot of early, a lot of late. Um, I was on a horse for basically two days and then both the horse and I determined that there were <laughs> the horse should be doing better things. And, um, and I figured, yeah, that's probably something I should be. Oh my God, come on, let me quit mail. Okay, I'm back, sorry. It's okay. um, and it, and it was just like a great story. And it was a cover in 12 pages in Italy and a 10 pages in Germany and and a travel another travel magazine in Italy for 10 pages. And in the 70s, you had the ability, if you had the goods, the stuff could find a home in these publications. And that was what was really, you know, that was a great time to launch an agency, I think, because we we had we started collecting really good people early on in this little agency that um uh and that became kind of the whole basis that it all grew out of and so what was missing at the other agencies like why did you decide to go form your own well i had i'd had a couple of things happen with gamma and i, I always will look back on my two years with gamma as great time but there were one or two things that just ticked me off. Like I had shot this stuff in Africa, left it on the light box, and I came back like two months later and it was still stacked up on the light box. It's like, hello, you gotta, <laughs> <laughs> hello. Anyway, it like little things like that. And then we were in New York and we had pretty good relationship with Newsweek and Time and a uh, little bit with the US News and a little bit with the New York Times. And it was just like, okay, let's try and do this and with our own deal, our own people. And, you know, it was, I don't think there were ever any years that we had any, you know, we never got any of those million dollar scoops. We had a few really good deals, but it was a, it was always, I wouldn't say a struggle, but it was always a challenge to figure out where do you fit in, in this photo market. And yet it, between if you had one or two good clients and i was still when life magazine came back as a monthly i did a lot of work for them and i had still with time magazine um and the occasional sunday new york times magazine uh it was it was great it was like yeah that's what i wanted to do i want to go cover this or that and then and all through the um the end of the seventies and into the eighties, there were just, there was always something to do and there was always some kind of a market for it. And that's, to me, that's kind of the sad thing about right now is it just, you have to really work harder to find those things that'll 
work as a story and then find a place where a story like that can find a home and and you can send them a uh invoice <laughs> exactly to get paid for it um what do you think we could do like or, or what do you think would is there anything that could get like a life you know 2.0 like another life magazine alive like what would the funding how it how who what how you know i mean i just i don't know, I don't know. Like, it's it's some you would think i mean i think it's really interesting and i appreciate the fact that bezos uh took like one one hundredth of one percent of one percent of whatever he has and he bought the washington post and they they have kind of kept the post going because it's definitely hard for for newspapers daily papers to keep going I mean, the number of particularly weekly and uh, like two two or three times a week papers that have just closed in the last couple of years is just a frighteningly large number. And and it, I don't think it, it does not bode well for society at large and for the people who used to make the pictures to put out those newspapers. It's, it's just terrible. And, um, you know, the Post just had a number of people, Marianne Golan, who was the director of photography the last few years, and a couple of their really great photographers all took buyouts at the end of last year. And I don't know if they're hiring or not hiring. I don't know what the situation was. Oh, Somebody, let me kill them. I think that might have been the doorbell. <laughs> If there was an atomic attack, I would be able to tell you that right now. <laughs> there isn't. Okay, good. Uh, no, I mean, it's just, it's been, um, it's tough to find places, but you're right. What, what could be life? Well, really 3.0 for life. Right. It already did 2.0. And, and I don't know. I mean, they talk about maybe trying to bring it back, but who's going to do that in this news today about, how this company is trying to bring back Sports Illustrated, but they tend not to be brought back by the people who are, that have a little sense of what the magic was that made them so good in the beginning. I mean, maybe they're they're more into knowing how to run something, but something like Sports Illustrated, you really need some great photographers and some great writers, because that was not just oh, here's who beat who this week. I mean, it was, it was a melding of great pictures with great words. And that's the kind, I mean, the problem I think is that it's just so hard to find people to, um, uh, who, who can find the time to look at that magazine, you know? I just signed up for uh, the Mountain Journal or something. And what really attracted uh, it to me was that it's a big page size. I have no idea what's in it, but I thought, God, maybe I could go to a mountain and take a picture and get a full page picture in there. So I don't know. I mean, I, but I'm like you, I'm open to almost anything. Um, you That's know, in I, print. I, I think there is something about when you st pick up an old old magazine, that's got a good story and then you start to look at it, boy, there's something about that. I, I mean, I, I had a few really fun stories. I, after the Argentine uh, dictator Juan Perón died in the summer of 1974, and I won't tell you the whole story, but I was the one guy that got to the top of the Capitol Dome and the inside and looked down and he's lying on an open casket. And I'd never met him, I'd never photographed him, but I kind of look over the edge of the the marble uh, railing, you know, 60 feet high and boom, he's just looking right up at me. And I talk my way up there. It is a great two martini story some night. But I got the picture, the, the, uh, the film went to New York and it, it opened a full page in time magazine and whatever else you want to say about time magazine in those days, at least 25 million people would see it every week. So that wow. was something, even if, uh, you know, my Mary Decker picture was a half page in Time Magazine, but 25 million people saw that half page. 
It's a lot. So it's kind of trade, you know, could have been a full page or would have been great two page spread as it was in Europe. A couple of magazines probably would have been great, but but then it would have been 300,000 people in Germany. So, okay, so each thing has its own strength and its own power. But the uh, the Peron picture, it came out the next week and in Buenos Aires at all the newsstands, they took like six copies of Time Magazine and folded it open to that full page and with clothespins would ping, 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 just, Picture, picture. And of course, stupid me, I never took a picture of the newsstand. I was about to ask you, do you have that? <laughs> there is no proof. Ah. You know, sometimes you just forget the, the yep. simple words are take a picture first and then let's talk. But <laughs> it's uh, that was something that just was so striking because I had been, uh, you know, it was just one of those things that really worked out. There was one of my arch rivals from Sigma, which was the, that was, I was still with Gamma and Sigma, Alan Noguez, great photographer, great guy. But um, it had been, we were trying to, out, it was spy versus spy, basically, out of like, <laughs> at magazine. You know, we're kind of traipsing around in the Capitol building and their Capitol looks just like our Capitol, big dome, beautiful building. And at one end of one hallway, there was this bar that was a, a, a an espresso coffee bar just for the press. Nice. And so we would go in and out of there. And then there was one place that you had to shoot pictures of Peron. So it was like after an hour, you'd kind of done everything you could do. And you're starting, I'm thinking, oh, maybe there's a picture up there. Anyway, it was the kind of thing that drives you. Sometimes it's it's that kind of rivalry with somebody who you know can be way better than you at the right moment but if i get if i get the right chance here i get a chance to come away with a picture and so i don't know those are those the ones where it worked were great and even the ones where i totally screwed myself or got screwed or whatever there's something sort of charming to have tried and okay didn't doesn't always work out but I just I love being I love being in the mix of of what those you know well how do we find out where the picture is going to be and the best part of this story is the whole thing is I'd run into Alan outside and we both decide okay we got enough out here big crowd and everything we walk around we try and and go in officially into this Capitol building. And Time Magazine had known that I was coming and they get, got me a press card. So when I dropped my suitcases off at the bureau, they gave me the card. So we got over there. Alain had come straight from the airport, had no press card other than his <laughs> And we get to the door and this guy is like, what are you doing here? And said, well, we're photographers. We need to get in. And I flashed my little card. So you're okay. He can't come in. And I immediately said, but this is my assistant. I must have him come with me. And the guy's like, well, all right. And we get in there, we're walking down the hallway. And he says, and Alan, he just was very thankful that I got him in there. But it was like, and I said, that, it's like, I don't want to win this competition by you not getting in the building. <laughs> I want to, now I'm not, now I want to beat your ass now that we're in the building. <laughs> but you don't want to use some cheap ass trick like that, too. <laughs> it, was, it was just, and so many, the thing is, this is something that hasn't been mentioned. Most of the people in this business are great people. They're people you want to compete with. And if you're going to get beat, okay, then at least get beat by somebody who you really admire. And then let's go have a drink or a coffee and sort of sulk about it or <laughs> try not to be a, a jerk about having lucked out to get the best picture. I mean, you'll be on both ends of that one you know, in a very short time, every now and then for every time that you get the picture, there'll be a couple where it just is not going to be your day. And that's <laughs> kind of the way life is. And that's yeah. by me, that's fine. You know, that's, I'm perfectly fine with that. I, well, you've I, had I, a lot of uh, amazing pictures where it was the winner and uh, it's been fantastic. And Dave, we're almost out of time. Unfortunately, it's two o'clock. Um, 
I think we're just going to have to have you back. We didn't get to the Olympics. I wanted to talk to you about the butterflies because you were talking about creativity. We got to talk more about Palm Beach. So I think just uh, we should come back whenever the, you know, the next opportunity is. is there anything, in closing, is there anything we um, you want to mention briefly or or did you freeze again? I think he's very stoic. Okay, I think that might have been Zoom uh, telling us we may have to wrap. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was David Barnett, who was unfortunately slightly uh, uh, having a moment. Or I think Zoom was having a moment. <laughs> um, but I will be back in a couple of weeks with the uh, director from APAD, which I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, speaking to her about the upcoming photo fair. So thank you all. Thank you, B&H. And I am Stephen Mallon, and I will see you all soon. All right. Thank you.